Greetings, dear viewer, dear listener. My name is Ron Bleicher, and this is a video in which I share my passion for writing. Uh, and I hope, uh, perhaps more importantly, the kind of insights I gained about writing over the past 30 or so years. I'm an academic, and to a great extent, I am an academic because I love writing. This is what I do in life, this is what I do every day, this is what I, where my passion lies, this is where I get, get my inspiration from. Now, I like other parts of my job, I like teaching, I like PhD supervision, I like many other things, but ultimately it's the, the writing that fascinates me and that's the reason why I'm an academic. Over the past uh, 20 or more than 20 years, I have worked at the University of Queensland in Australia, where I am Professor of International Relations, and in every single one of my courses, undergraduate and postgraduate, I spent one week on research and writing strategies. I think this is absolutely crucial. It's crucial to kind of succeed for my students in their studies, but also to succeed in whatever else they do afterwards. And in our kind of uh, context in politics, international relations, we don't really teach students systematically how to, to research and how to write. And that's why I devote an entire week to this topic. I usually do a lecture of about an hour. And so I thought this year, instead of basically redoing the same lecture again and again, I record it here. So I record it primarily for my students uh, in my undergraduate and postgraduate classes. But I hope that this also is useful for some of you who are listening in here. Uh, I decided in the end I might uh, even put it up on YouTube. Now, I do not claim to have found the best, uh, certainly not the only way of, of writing. Uh, there's lots of writers who are a lot, a lot better than me, but I thought what I can do is basically share what I've learned over 30 years of as an academic, as a writer, as a PhD supervisor, and as an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher. So what I want to do basically is I want to do three set of things. I want to sort of move from very, very broad, general insights into writing, psychologically, uh, uh, basically psychological tips about, about how to gain confidence, how to make writing part of your daily activity, how to enjoy it and struggle at the same time about the importance of reading, the importance of, 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 of practice and so on, uh, of figuring things out through writing, to more sort of specific uh, uh, suggestions about the importance of finding your voice, the importance of writing in accessible uh, ways of avoiding jargon, the importance of rhythm, of, 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 of sound in language, uh, to then examine a couple of good and bad openings of texts to illustrate <clears throat> for you what I think works and what doesn't, uh, to then, in the end, basically go to much more specific uh, suggestions about how to craft texts. And here I talk about puzzle-driven research, about the importance of arguments, of, of, the, of basically articulating one clear central point, um, of uh, one-page plans, which is something I use with my PhD students to drafting and redrafting. So given that it's a video, uh, you have the chance basically to fast forward if you think some of the stuff is, is really not, not useful. So, um, um, but that's why I sort of gave you a bit of a sense of what I'm going to do in what might be about an hour uh, or so. So very briefly to start with very, very broad kind of uh, suggestions of broad ideas about writing. Uh, one thing is, and that's particularly relevant for, for my students to do a PhD or to do a master's thesis or to do an undergraduate thesis, is that if you develop your own topic, one of the key things, I think, is to really develop a topic that you feel absolutely passionate about. Uh, you know, don't have a topic assigned by your supervisor. Don't have a topic um, that you find is important because people tell you so or because it's currently in fashion. Research something that you feel absolutely passionate about. Um, and I'll talk later on about the importance of puzzles that, that sort of then develop this passion. Next thing is... Um, there's no shortcut. Writing is about practice. It's about, and I'll talk soon about the question of, or the issue of sort of making it part of your everyday life. Uh, it requires effort. And the reason why I have uh, one of my favorite writers here uh, up on board, Joyce Carol Oates, is she's an example of that. You know, she is an extremely prolific writer. Uh, she writes about a book every year, different types of books, long books, short books, novella, novels, essays. 
And it's through that regular practice that that she's become an absolutely world class rider. Uh, and you know, it it'll, it takes decades, and you don't have decades if you're in your undergraduate degree. But but you can start a habit of making riding part of what you do, and by doing so, you're going to get better and better and better. The other thing, and again, that's primarily a tip for my for my students, is to to get started early on your essay, whatever it is. Get started, plan, write, finish a draft at least a month before the due date, put it aside, give it to a friend to read, revise it. That's absolutely key uh, to success. Um, the next sort of general sort of tip I have about how to go about things is to recognize that writing really is about, it's very, it's very, very much psychological. It's about feeling confident, feeling comfortable with oneself. You know, writing is about, about looking inwards and I think a lot of us who had experiences in life, whatever they are, and then sort of get to the point of becoming a writer and want to write about these experiences, find that very difficult. All of a sudden, lots of stuff comes up in our head when we are quiet, when we spend hours and hours and weeks and weeks in the library at home writing, things can actually become quite difficult. So it's about feeling comfortable with oneself as a writer, with one's ideas, and to sort of find ways of figuring stuff out through writing. Now, to me, for instance, when I, if I have an interest in something, I can't just read. I need to write. And writing, for me, is about figuring things out. Um, so you need to then sort of develop or figure out what works for you. Um, everyone works differently. Everyone has different ways of going about things. So figure out what kind of writing rhythm works best for you. What I can say for me, what works best is basically to make writing part of my daily activity. Part of something I do every day. I'm a morning person, you know, I get up fairly early in the morning, I'm recording this lecture here in Brisbane as the sun is about to rise, and usually in the morning I spend a few hours writing uh, before the rest of the day sets in, before I do lectures and meetings and a lot of stuff. So for me, the reason why that works is then writing is not something that becomes difficult. If you spend a lot of time reading and then start writing, you get very tense. You know, it's, it, it's difficult. You figure out it's, it's, you know, you have writing blocks, so to speak. But if you write every day, it's just, it's not, nothing stressful. It's just something you do every day, like brushing your teeth, having breakfast, going about things. It's not something that's, that's, that's uh, unusual. So, so to me, that's the, the, the key to actually uh, becoming a good writer. It doesn't work for everyone. You know, some people are what one could call binge writers. They read and read and read and read, and then in, in one non-stop go, write it all up. You know, I think here, for instance, of Jack Kerouac, uh, whose book uh, uh, On the Road uh, uh, was ex sort of reflecting seven years of, as he calls it, bombing around, and then something like two or three weeks of writing it up in, all, in, in a three-week flash of, of mad writing, uh, fueled by caffeine and, and whatever else. So that might work as well for some. Uh, it's really, you have to figure out what works for me, uh, for you. Uh, all I can say is for me, the kind of the habit of, of writing every day uh, works very well. And I've done that for, for the last 30 or so years. Uh, and the last sort of general thing is about, you know, basically just enjoying the privilege of being able to write, of having the time and the opportunity to write. Uh, writing to me is a highly creative activity. It's like painting. It's like it's something very creative. And, and, and uh, uh, we can all make a difference through writing. Writing for me is a form of activism. And sort of one text that I often use as an example is, is Etienne Laboissi's uh, Discours de la Servitude Volontaire. It's a text uh, I teach in uh, a master's class. I, uh, I teach on the politics of nonviolent resistance, civil disobedience. It's, an, it's um, a text from uh, the early modern period, from 1562. Uh, about basically, in many ways, the foundation text for civil disobedience. I'm not going to go into the detail of what it says, but it was written by La Boissy when he was a student at the University of Orléans uh, at the age of 18. So basically, it's, his, it's, it's an undergraduate paper he wrote. And more than half a millennium later, we still read it. It's, it's wonderfully written, and it sort of gives me always the sense that basically everyone can write a text that ultimately will be picked up uh, later on by others. So it's about having this unique chance of basically crafting something that's fun, that's interesting, that's revealing, and that might be able to, to be read by others. Um, the next sort of general point about 
about good writing is, and I think that's an important point, is good writing really is only possible by good reading, by lots of reading. So I think the key thing, I think, is to read, 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 uh, and especially to read broadly. Uh, don't just read in your own discipline. You know, I'm an international relations scholar. So I work in, in peace studies and political theory. I think to do good work in that realm uh, requires reading outside our disciplines, reading in, in psychology, in anthropology, in literature, in cultural studies, in philosophy, in a range of different areas. And perhaps more importantly is to read outside uh, of social science, outside of our disciplines. You know, in my field, international relations, most people who write in international relations are absolutely terrible writers. They write awful texts. You know, they, ha they have what, what I call writing constipation. They write in this dense, jargon-filled, heavy, passive voice kind of language that's just awful to read. So I think, you know, the key to do good writing is not to emulate that kind of style, but to emulate the style of good writers. Um, that means to read good writers, to read novelists. Uh, uh, I just have up here on screen some of the ones I admire and read, uh, Sadi Smith, uh, uh, Paul Ceylon, Anna Akhmatova, uh, uh, Raymond Carver, just four examples of many, many writers uh, that I f feel um, are inspiring. So in that sense, you know, what I suggest is read not just texts in political science or whichever, whichever fields are, you're in, read novelists, read um, poets, read good essays, you know, for instance, I don't know, The New Yorker, for instance, where whatever t text you, you're reading, whether it's sport or history or biography, is written well, is written, written in a kind of an accessible way. Learn from how poets and novelists communicate. And, and try to kind of basically write in a way that allows you to, to have this sort of clear sense of communication. Um, but good, good reading, lots of reading, lots of good reading is essential to good writing. Uh, and again, make that part of your daily kind of activity as well, just as you do with, with writing, research and writing at the same time. Same time, I think, as I said, writing is fun, writing is, is interesting, but writing is also a struggle, you know, and I think there's no point in denying it. Good texts often emerge from a struggle. If you write an essay, if you write a thesis, everything is smooth from the beginning, it's likely that you're going to write a rather boring, bland kind of text. But if you struggle about something, and we'll soon talk about the importance of puzzles, if you struggle, you might come up with something very interesting. I have here a quote from one of my favorite writers, Nietzsche. Uh, I'm not going to read it all out, but he basically says that, that good writing emerges out of this this struggle out of damp and gloomy days, out of solitude, out of loveless words directed at us. Then conclusions grow up in us like a fungus. They're just there one morning. You know, uh, and we will also soon talk about not starting with an argument, starting with a puzzle. And the argument then at some point will appear when you struggle about something, when you find something out, when you twist it, when you rewrite it, when you kind of take a break from your text and, and that's when you kind of find often the most interesting the most counterintuitive arguments that come up so basically accept that writing is a struggle and i want to illustrate that uh, through a painting by matisse and i, I apologize i'm not usually in the habit of showing uh, naked women in my class i'm a feminist scholar and this is something uh, i don't i don't i don't do but this is a very good example of a painting by matisse that looks very simple this looks like an effortless painting, one of his very famous paintings, figurative, semi-abstract, and it looks like it's been done in about, about um, I don't know, maybe an hour or so. Uh, it captures us. A bit like a good text. A good text is simple, it's clear, it evokes, it can be read, it's remembered years and years and decades later like this painting. Uh, but Matis, interestingly, uh, has actually taken photographs when he painted this painting to see how he actually painted it. And when you look at these photographs, you can see the kind of struggle he had when he was painting. He didn't just develop the text or the painting right away. He went through numerous different inter iterations of the subject he was painting. He moved things around, uh, and this is sort of black and white. He, uh, in color, you would have different colors changing as well, different positions, back and forth in, 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 in different ways, again, again, day after day, week after week, playing with different forms of representation, different forms of interpretation, different colors, different ways of understanding things, abstracting the essence out of things, 
adding the essence again, abstracting again, changing, until in the end, basically, the painting is where it is today. It looks simple, it looks straightforward, but there's a lot of drafting and redrafting and re-redrafting uh, uh, as a part of it. A second quick sample from my own work, recent work, I've just worked on a grant proposal with a few colleagues. I've worked about three years on that. I recently submitted that as a grant proposal, and the proposal has a short uh, abstract at the bottom here. And I think I must have gone through about 30, 40, 50 different versions of this abstract, developed over, I don't know, maybe six months or so. And I have uh, documents on my computer where I have version 1, version 2, version 3, version 20, version 25, until I was at the point where I felt everything is correct, the rhythm, the content, how it captured it. I'm not sure if it's a good paragraph, but, but uh, all this is to say, I didn't expect this paragraph to be there at the beginning right away. It's part of a long process of drafting and redrafting. Now, this gets me to the point that basically we can't, uh, as a writer, figure things out right away. That is, expect that we can sort of read stuff and then once we have read everything, write it up and it's all there. I think we have to accept, we should accept, that basically writing is a way of figuring things out itself. So what I suggest with particularly my PhD students, for instance, write from day one. Don't think you have to first spend a year reading everything in your field and then once you have read everything, start writing. You start writing right away. You read and write at the same time and you work things out by, by, by reading and writing parallel. Uh, I also think it's very useful, and I use that in my classes very often, and my students know they have to do that uh, in the research and writing week, is to write a stream of consciousness, kind of do a stream of consciousness exercise. That is to basically, once you have a topic you want to investigate, spend an hour or so somewhere quiet, in the library, uh, uh, in a public park, uh, in your bathroom, wherever you find a quiet space, turn all of your electronic devices off, and for an hour, just write. See where it takes you. See what comes out. And often writing in that sense then becomes something where almost something else, someone else comes in and writes for you. And stuff comes out that you actually find quite surprising. And a lot of my students say, yeah, look, I developed these interesting ideas that I didn't know I had. I drew on these resources that I didn't know I, I, I had. And by doing so, you can actually make a lot of progress about how, how you're going to go about in your text, whether it's an essay, a thesis, or whatever you do. So combine research and writing, reading and writing all the time. Don't just read, don't just write, combine the two, take notes, uh, put them into files. I'm not going to you know, elaborate how, how I do that, but everyone has their different filing system. I usually do that and throw it into files, and then once I get to start to write the actual draft, they often have three, four, five thousand words of notes, of ideas, of, of citations, of, of plans for, for structures that I can start actually running with when I get to, to write the actual text I'm writing on. So I'm going to sort of now go from these general tips to becoming a little bit more specific. Now, one thing I feel very passionate about and I feel I'm more passionate about with every single year I spent as a writer is to avoid jargon. Uh, again, as I said, in my field in political science, international relations, most texts are written are, are just terrible. They're badly written. They're full of jargon. They, they, they sound sophisticated, but they're often just bad writing. So I'm a huge fan of basically writing in texts that are uh, free of jargon, acronyms, technical terms. You know, in my field, you always hear about dependent and independent variables, about empty signifiers, about norm entrepreneurs, about epistemology, ontology. You don't need all that. You need these terms to understand the texts you read, but, but I think uh, good writing is basically avoiding such jargonesque term and write in everyday language as much as possible in everyday language. That's the, the beauty and the difficulty of a good text, is to get across sophisticated, difficult ideas and to do so in clear, everyday language that basically allows any kind of reader who is intelligent to read the text without necessarily knowing uh, what they do. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, memorable sort of uh, experiences I had about this is uh, listening in, in Boston to a lecture by the political theorist uh, Hannah Pitkin. Uh, she works on, um, 
on, on, on Wittgenstein, or she worked at, uh, on Wittgenstein. And of course, Wittgenstein is in a highly, highly kind of um, uh, complicated writer, writes in very dense ways, and most people who have never read Wittgenstein would have really great struggle to, to read his texts. But, but Hannah Picken started her, her lecture in this kind of almost banal way. She, it, was, it was very boring at first. She talked about, you know, like here we have, I don't remember what she said, but here we have an apple, here we have a pear, they're two different things. It's, it's almost like she would talk to, to kindergarten uh, uh, students, you know, kindergarten uh, 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 people. And with every kind of minute she talked, she would add one layer of sophistication. At the end, you could basically follow her entire text or entire speech on Wittgenstein without having had any kind of prior knowledge because she let the reader in. She explained everything step by step in, 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 in an accessible, clear language. To me, that's, that's the key thing to good writing. Yeah. And that also links, links to, to a related thing is that when you write, you have to find your own voice. You have to write in your own voice. That's a very difficult thing to do. It takes a long time to do. The temptation, of course, is always to, to write like the text you read. For instance, if you read all, you know, if you write a thesis on Habermas and you read Habermas the whole time, you're likely to write like Habermas in this dense, passive German kind of way. If you do a thesis on Judy Spotler, you write like Judy Spotler in, in a highly technical way. So I think the the the, the key to good writing in that sense is to translate whatever you read, whether it's, it's Habermas, whether it's Butler, whether it's uh, any other text, into your own voice, into your own way of expressing things, uh, using your own terms, using your own sentence structure, using your own kind of way of going about it. Uh, a good text is a text where you can recognize basically um, a, a writer's voice, just like you would recognize Matisse as a kind of right, uh, painting style, so to speak. Uh, like painters, writers have their own kind of style. Uh, so imprint your personality on the text. Um, another good uh, exercise is something I, I suggest to all of my students, and uh, whether it's on the graduate PhD and to myself, is once you finish a draft of your text, Give it to someone to read who knows nothing about your field. You know, I don't know, your uncle, your, your grandmother, uh, your best friend, uh, who is intelligent, who reads, but really is not in your field. And ask them, does my text make sense? Is it accessible? Ask them to repeat to you back what the key point of your text is, what the key argument is. And if they're if they able to basically repeat back to you, oh, this is essay is about X and it does make the key point Y, then you have succeeded. But if they tell you, I have no bloody idea what this text is all about, you know, it's, it's, I don't know this, this, this literature, I don't know these, these terminologies, then I think you have work to do. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I think, a, a simple but, but a key part of successful writing is not to aim for a sophisticated, jargon-filled, heavy kind of text, but to, to something that's basically accessible and clear. And part of that has to do with something that seems very kind of um, simple and silly, but actually is very important. And is a text has to have rhythm, in my view. It has to flow. You have to be able to dance with a text. Uh, so uh, is it pleasant to read? Is it nice to read? That's, it seems like um, almost like a trivial issue, an issue that's not really about the substance. But to me, this is all about substance. If a text is nice to read, a person can focus on the substance of the text. If a text is badly written, you don't even get to the substance. Uh, so, uh, um, so one thing uh, I always do, for instance, with, with my own texts is once I finish, I read them aloud. And I stand up and I see if I can dance with a text. If I can see if the text has rhythm, if I can dance, if it, if it flows, if it's pleasant to read. And you can only tell so actually if you read the text aloud. So do that with your text, with your first draft. Read it aloud, stand up, and see if you can walk around. And to me, it's infuriating that most social scientists don't pay any attention to that. Uh, for instance, uh, if I send a book or a, an article out, I get copy editing uh, 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 corrections back. And sometimes a copy editor would sort of change uh, a noun or an adjective and, and replace another one or take it out because it's not there. And often by doing so, they screw up the entire rhythm of the text. And they don't realize you can't just replace one word with another one, which might have the same meaning or a better meaning. 
But by doing so often, you then kind of interrupt the entire flow of the text. So I sometimes then would have to, in order to do justice to that new, new word, I would have to rewrite the entire sentence or the entire paragraph so that the text flows again, is pleasant to read. Um, um, so to do so, I think you know what you need to do is basically finish a text early. Uh, um, um, pay attention to rhythm, alterate long and short sentences, uh, uh, alterate active and passive voice. Uh, um, so that sort of uh, uh, takes time, and and it and it's important to kind of do. When I think of that flow, that rhythm, I think of an experience I had uh, listening to uh, a poet, Quincy Troop, uh, in Flagstaff once, long time ago, and he presented his his kind of poet poems in a way that basically was clear. He was dancing with them. He stood up and he kind of. Uh, Basically, everything flowed with with his presentation. In fact, he was a, a friend of Miles Davis, and I think he, he co-wrote Miles Davis's autobiography. So I looked on 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 the web, and I actually found um, found a video in which Quincy Troops uh, recites one of his poems. And I give you a quick example here of a text that flows of a writer who actually dances with his own uh, texts. In a place beyond our knowing, silence reigns, darkness. Perhaps some light echoes in this vast space. Perhaps it is a never, 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 never world, an ethereal of maybe. If spirits among us know what it is, they have never spoken. Perhaps shadows have over underground in some invisible space surrounded. Now, you're obviously not going to present your text in political science, international politics, or social science in that particular manner, but and it, the words that Quincy Troop used don't matter that much, but, but keep in mind um, the whole issue of rhythm is, a, is of crucial importance. I'm going to give you a couple examples soon about that. Linked to this uh, is also uh, the recognition that the text really, really has to pull the reader in. Now, part of it is the rhythm, is the sound, is the, 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 the capturing text. The other thing is basically the title and the opening paragraph. These are two very, very crucial elements. They basically decide whether a reader is going to read your text or not, uh, whether you know uh, someone is captured by it. Uh, uh. Think of basically uh, observe which text you read and, and not, you know, whether you open up a newspaper, whether you look on the web, you know, if you have a, a, a capturing title and if the first few lines of a, of, a, of a text pull you in, you're going to continue reading. Um, if not, you're going to turn the page and you're going to read something else. Um, and again, for my students, think of, of me sort of marking 30, 40, 50 essays. You know, if, if, I, if I have marked already 10, 15 essays, I get to number 16, it's already 8 p.m., and I kind of read this, this boring title, this, this, this boring opening, I'm just going to, you've already lost me. You know, even if the, the essay is good afterwards, you lost me. But if the title is interesting, if the opening paragraph captures me, You've already basically won me halfway through. You know, it's like splashing uh, fresh water in in one's face. So, so the opening is extremely crucial. I'm going to give you afterwards a few tips about how to to do good openings, and I want to sort of illustrate one good good opening again to come back to Quincy Troop, who you've just seen when when he presented his poems in in Flagstaff these years ago. I, I remember this one poem he had. And I couldn't find it actually. I don't know where it appeared in writing, but it was one poem about racism. About he, how he, as a, uh, from memory again, I might be wrong, but from memory, how he, as an educated African American, well dressed, was in some train. I don't know where, between Washington and New York or somewhere. And in comes a white person who is drunk, and it basically just abuses him of why he sits in this, I think he was a first-class compartment, why he's sitting in this first-class compartment, you know, uh, and so on, basically a racist kind of abuse. And I don't remember the poem, I don't remember what is in there, but I still remember the opening line of that poem. The opening line was, he could not even spell Albuquerque. And so he started that line, it was in Flagstaff in Arizona, and everyone obviously just started to basically just just laugh out loud. It was it was such a kind of capturing open line. So, so whenever I, I compose my texts, whether it's an essay, whether it's an op-ed, whether it's a blog, whether it's 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 a book, 
I think about the opening line of my text and I think, what can I write that's the equivalent of he could not even spell Albuquerque. You know, something that just literally just captures the reader in this opening line of the paragraph, pulls the reader in. So think of that when you compose text. Think of the importance of titles and the importance of, of capturing the reader. Uh, when I think of the, the kind of essays that I've written over the last 30 years, uh, the ones that sort of been successful are often the ones that had a good, uh, a good title. Um, um, now, what I want to do now before uh, moving on to, to more concrete strategies is I want to give you a couple of samples of opening passages that I think work well and opening passages that work not so well. To give you just a sense of, of what I mean with these general approaches to writing about, about, about accessible writing, about, about, about dancing with the text and so on. So here is one opening of a text. Dodd should make Usif come the supporting sink for C2 and strengthen its role as joint force integrator. The regional sink requires a joint operation, etc., etc. Now, this is an obvious example. This is an example from, uh, uh, from a text in my field in security policy. And it's something that would be a fascinating text for someone to read who is basically familiar with strategic studies. Uh, DOD, you know, most probably would know, Department of Defense. But then once we get to more acronyms, basically, you can only read this text if you're familiar with strategic studies, with defense policy, with the kind of jargon in defense policy that, that, we, that, that, that specialists know in this field. So this text basically limits its audience already to a very, very small audience in, in this field. No matter how good the text is, no insightful, it's unlikely to reach a broad audience. Now, this is just an, an example, but you have similar examples in quantitative international relations studies, in post-structuralist uh, uh, international relations studies. If a text is written in this kind of subdisciplinary jargon, it just basically sabotages itself, I think. You know? and, and ultimately, for me, a text is all about convincing others who not only do believe in what you, what you say. So if this text wants to convince a non-specialist about the importance of something, you have to write in accessible language, beyond jargon, beyond acronyms. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, again, I'm, I'm not just against uh, uh, acronyms, but also uh, jargon, but also against acronyms in that sense, because they, by definition, exclude. Second example. This has no acronyms, no jargon, but is for different reasons hard to read. On January 7, 1978, comma, Exactly one week after Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, comma, the Shah of Iran, comma, hosted a New Year's Eve party where the President of the United States, comma, Jimmy Carter, comma, toasted to the Shah's health and long life, comma, Etalat, comma, a national newspaper in Iran, comma, published an article critical of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, comma, accusing him of being connected with a foreign power. Now, this is a fascinating book. It's very insightful. But as you can see, it's also challenging to read. Not because it has words that we don't understand, but because the grammar is, is very, very heavy. Long sentences, often passive voice. Try to dance with this text. Try to stand up and dance with it. It's impossible. You're going to get stuck moving around. Uh, and again, that's where the dance is important. You don't, obviously, when you read a text, Normally, you don't stand up and, and dance with a text. But if you can dance with a text, it means you can read it. It's smooth. It's accessible. You can focus on the substance of what's being said. If you read this text, and it's a good writer, an insightful writer, but if you focus on this text, it's very, very hard to actually focus on the substance because you have to spend so much time figuring out what is being said and which part of the sentence belongs to where. And, and after a few pages, you're exhausted. You know, with a good text, after a few pages, you revitalize. You, know, you get energy out of it. Um, that's why the whole issue of dancing, of flow, of rhythm is really crucial. Now, just a couple, of, um, a couple of examples from successful texts. So look at this one. Stories of combat provide a way of coping with a fundamental tension of war. Although the act of killing another person in battle may invoke a wave of Noseo's distress, it may also incite, uh, incite intense feeling of pleasure. 
This is an example from Joanna Burke, uh, uh, a historian who's written, uh, who's analyzed in this particular book, uh, um, diaries of of soldiers in different wars. Uh, I think First World War, Second World War, Vietnam War, and she finds something very puzzling. You know, they all were absolutely appalled by war. They were stressed. They had PTSD. They were just traumatized. But at the same time, they found this kind of. Or she found a lot of these diaries had actually these these entries where they felt uh, where soldiers felt pleasure in war, felt this excitement, this kind of unusual pleasure. And these were not sadistic soldiers; they were everyday soldiers, normal soldiers. So she tried to figure out basically why is this the case? Why do we have? Why my most soldiers have this odd tension between basically uh, this absolutely incredible feeling of distress, of trauma, of awfulness, and joy at the same time. So here you find two things of a successful test. You find a puzzle. You know, this is something that basically you, you kind of find has no answer pr at, at first sight. You want to investigate it. You want to find out. You want to find out why is this all tension between kind of uh, 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 pleasure and, and pain, so to speak. It's also uh, nicely written, it has flow, it, it, it's clear. So it pulls the reader in. Um, that's, I think, an example of a very good text where the author manages to pull the reader in. Second example. This is from um, John Caputo, a book called Against Ethics. I have for some time now entertained certain opinions that I have been reluctant to make public. But I have at length concluded that the time has come to air my views clearly and without apology, and to suffer whatever consequences come my way. I am against ethics. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. Again, to me, that's, that's an example of a successful text. Uh, it pulls the reader in. For one, it's written in this beautiful kind of flowing way. You know, it alterates a long paragraph, and I'll talk about that a bit later in the, in the, the lecture. A long paragraph is a very short paragraph that says, I am against ethics. It sticks out. But also, it's a puzzle. You know, you ask yourself, why the fuck is he against ethics? This is like, it's crazy. You know, no one is against ethics. Everyone is for ethics. Ethics is something good, something that we can't possibly be against. And, of course, the book develops the argument around that, and the argument is basically is not against ethics per se, but is against universal kind of ethics, a form of ethics that, that's, that's captured in universal, in universal rules and norms and regulations, and more in favor of a face-to-face -face ethics that's developed in the context of encounters between people. Yeah. But again, an example for me of a successful text that's clear. There's lots of other ones that I've just this morning started to read, uh, Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh's book on decoloniality, and it has an absolutely wonderful opening, flows well, so I could give you... Um, Dozens and dozens of examples of good writing. But think about, the, about it yourself, perhaps, when you pick up a book, an article, and, and you read the title and the opening. Think of what works and what doesn't and why that's the case. Uh, I think it's a very good exercise uh, to become a, a better writer. So, so now, in, in the last uh, part of uh, what I want to sort of talk about, we get into much more concrete sort of research and writing strategies to sort of translate this general... Um, attitudes about writing, insights of writing, into concrete things. And the first thing here, basically, to me, um, the first start of research, in my field at least, the first way of going about it is basically to think of research as puzzle-driven. That is, not to start with uh, an argument, with, a, with something you already know, but to start with trying to figure out a puzzle that doesn't have an answer. Uh, a puzzle can be something that makes you wonder, makes you pause, makes you agonize, makes you search for conclusions, a tension, a contradiction, something counterintuitive, a gap, basically something that, that tells you and the reader, I want to find out. You know, again, like, like the example of, of, um, of Joanna Burke's thing, why is it that all these diaries about soldiers in war have this odd tension between this agony about war, this trauma, and also this pleasure? 
What is it? You know, we don't know. Now, you, you literally don't know. That's the purpose of research, is to find out. And you need this puzzle to start off with so that you can then develop a research project in which you want to find out. You can agonize yourself, a bit like I said, Matisse. You can go through all these various searches and figure out why is it that soldiers have pain and pleasure at the same time? Is it this? Is it that? I'm not sure. You know, that's basically has to be the start of a good project, you know, a good essay, a good, a good PhD thesis, a good book. And um, uh, with my PhD students, for instance, I spend at least three to six months at the very beginning developing a clear, compelling puzzle. Uh, to me, that's one of 50% of a good PhD thesis, of a good essay, is to have this clear, compelling puzzle that you can then investigate. Uh, now, a puzzle... A puzzle doesn't need to be complex. It doesn't need to be kind of extremely sophisticated. In fact, the very, very best puzzles are the ones that are right in our face. In fact, the best puzzles are the ones that are so close to our face that we can no longer see them. You know, look at the classical example, of course, is Newton's uh, puzzle uh, 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 about the apple. You know, he sat under a tree and then his apple fell down and he asked himself, why did this apple fall down? Why didn't it fall up? You know, something that we never ask ourselves. Of course, an apple falls down. An apple doesn't just fall up into the sky because we are so much used to seeing it, so much used to this dynamic of an apple falling down, everything falling down. If you drop something, you know, it just falls down to the ground. But by asking this very, very simple question back then, he de basically developed a puzzle that then led to path-breaking scientific research on gravity. You know, we didn't know stuff about gravity back then. So, so, so that's sort of, it's a very, very simple puzzle that then led to, to, to huge amounts of research. A second example from a, a former PhD student from quite a long time ago of mine, Erin Wilson, who is now Professor Erin Wilson at the University of Groningen, where she is doing absolutely path-breaking research on religion, where she founded uh, a center for, for uh, religion and, and public uh, policy and ethics, um, an absolutely path-breaking scholar. Her PhD uh, uh, was basically started off with a very, very simple puzzle. And that puzzle was that all religions around the world, almost all of them, preach love. It's part of the religious text is about love. So why, if this is the case, why is it that we have so much conflict between religion? Why all these religious wars? It doesn't make sense. If all these religions are about love, where does the conflict come from? You know, where is it? You know, of course, that's a very, very broad puzzle, and you then have to kind of narrow it down to a much more specific topic. But that's something you can sort of start off with and say, why? You know, I want to find out. I want to dig. I want to research. I want to read books, interview people. I want to do archival work, whatever it is. In my own research uh, with my colleague Emma Hutchison, we look at the role of emotions in politics. In fact, she is sort of the leading uh, scholar on emotions. I'm more in because I'm fascinated on, on emotions. But here, again, the fundamental puzzle we sort of started off with about 15 years ago when we worked on emotions was this puzzle that on the one hand, emotions seem absolutely central to politics. It's sort of obvious, you know, like terrorism, war, all these kind of key parts of international politics are highly emotional. You know, the reasons why people engage in terrorism, in war, the people, the reactions to, to, uh, to war are emotional. I work on humanitarianism and, and the images of humanitarian crisis, crisis. They're highly emotional. And yet, at the same time, almost all of the models we have in our field, in politics, international relations, in economics, they sort of revolve around the assumptions that people and actors like states act rationally. So the models are developed on the assumption that we have these rational actors who, who engage in a cost-benefit analysis when they make choices. So emotions are completely written out. So why? What's the, why is that the case? And what can we learn from it? What do we do about it? You know, again, a puzzle that we don't have the answers yet right away, but we need to basically investigate. So to me, that's the basis of, of, of a, a good essay, a good text, is, is having that kind of puzzle to start with. Something uh, that you don't know about, something that you want to go and investigate. If you already have your answers, if you already have an argument, for one, you're going to get bored very quickly. You know, that's maybe not a, with a small undergraduate paper, but with a PhD thesis that takes three, four, five years. After six months, you're going to be bored uh, to tears. You know, it's just like, 
you know the answers. You just why, why digging? Why, why doing more research? But also, and more importantly, you just kind of go and find the evidence that supports your already foregone conclusion. Uh, so you're just going to basically gather evidence that, that confirms what you think and you ignore everything else. And you're going to write a text that's not very interesting, that's not innovative, uh, and that's perhaps highly problematic. Um, so I think to, to basically, uh, to avoid that, try when you start a research product not to think of solutions of argument, but think of questions of puzzles. Uh, a good text to, to read on that is Ian Shapiro, who argues in the context of North American sort of uh, political science research, which is very much method-driven, often quantitative, driven by quantitative methods. He argues very strongly against such methods-driven research and says we should basically find puzzles in the real world. You know, puzzles are there, and once we have that puzzle, then we go about developing our research project. Then we develop certain methods that are then suitable to answer these puzzles. So that's an important part, I think. It's also important, I think, a puzzle, again, pulls the reader in. If you can, in the opening paragraph, capture a key puzzle, you know, about religion. All religions pre preach love. Why then is there so much conflict around religion? A reader wants to know. A reader wants to read on, wants to find out. And then you, later on in your text, he then developed the answer to these questions. So how do we then translate these puzzles and the kind of general approaches to writing into a good text? Uh, first thing, of course, a puzzle is always way too broad. So you need to then narrow it down, develop a very, very specific research question that's manageable. Uh, and you need to focus. And in my experience of working with undergraduate students, postgraduate students, PhD scholars, myself, the danger is almost always to take on too much, to take on this huge topic. And if you do so, the danger is that you're basically not going to be able to offer any depth. You just sort of scratch barely beneath the surface, because if you take on so much, you have to do a lot of introduction about this and that. Uh, so I think the, it, it's almost impossible not to narrow a text uh, uh, or uh, focus too much, and then actually by narrowing a, uh, a focus, you can develop a clear kind of uh, uh, sustained strategy of, of analysis. Um, I got an example here, I think I have it up here, uh, that is uh, from James Scott, one of the writers I really admire. Uh, he's written a lot on, on practice of domination and resistance, um, and a lot of things. He is a writer who writes very accessibly. It's another reason why I like him. But also, he shows that basically he has developed or he has changed the way we think about domination and resistance, basically through extensive field research in a small village in Southeast Asia. I think it's in Malaysia. I might be mistaken. I'm not a, 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 an anthropologist. But by basically studying class relations in a very small village with a limited number of people, he then drew in all this big literature on, on domination and resistance and changed how we think about this topic. Because he was able to basically combine a discussion of big, large macro issues with very, very concrete empirical issues and could demonstrate how in a very concrete setting this works. And it's this combination of micro and macro, of big and small, of theory and practice, I think, that, that offers a good way of, of narrowing a topic down. So you can narrow a topic down in that sense in two ways. You can do you can do a case study on something. You can do a focus on something empirical. And again, it can't almost be not small enough for an essay. You could cover and you could focus on one newspaper article that covers a certain issue and then very, very carefully analyze that article, bring in a whole range of other issues. Or you can, of course, narrow a text down conceptually by basically focusing on um, a particular angle, whether it's, you know, I don't know, like the gender dimensions of something, whether it's a, a certain dilemma that has to do with the conceptual way we think about um, the key in doing so is whatever way you focus your, 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 your puzzle, whatever way you focus your inquiry, justify your focus. Um, tell us, tell the reader why you focus on this particular thing and not on others. And, and what often works then is sort of have a disclaimer to tell the reader that I'm fully aware that the issue is a lot more complex, there's this and that going on, it's not my task to engage that, I'm focusing on this and that specific issue for these and these reasons. Um, so that's sort of the next step after the puzzle. 
And then I'm not going to say much about the whole issue of basically reviewing the existing literature on method. This would be basically a, a topic of an entire another video that that would be a, a, at least an hour long. But obviously, whenever you start investigating a puzzle, what you need to do is basically tell the reader what we already know about this puzzle. So in, in, in the context of a PhD, this would, would be your literature review, uh, as it says. I usually try to steer my students away from writing a conventional literature review, which I think is boring, is, is not very insightful, but sort of use the review of the, of the literature very much in a way of developing uh, uh, your own narrative already, of basically saying more than just a review, a review of the literature. Uh, I also steer my students away from trying to sort of find a way of filling a gap. That's usually what the traditional way of setting up a topic is. is you, know, you look at the literature, you try to find a gap in the literature, and then you fill this gap with your own research. Uh, to me, this is a sort of a very heroic 19th century romantic notion of, of research is that there's some gaps out there, we can find them and then we heroically fill these gaps. Uh, I, I think it's more productive probably to think of sort of building on previous insights and using these insights to kind of develop things perhaps further. Less, so less filling a gap and more of sort of uh, standing on, on people who have done work before and building on what they have said and be generous with what people have said rather than sort of critique what's been said, be generous with what people have said and find a way of, of, of taking this further. Um, one way of doing so, and that's one reason why I, I like working with puzzles is when one works with puzzle one is less bound by disciplinary convention so you don't just have to review literature in one particular field but you can actually draw on whatever you can find if you start with a puzzle you can use any kind of insights from any kind of knowledge practice if they help you answer this puzzle your kind of insight is legitimate in my field this can be from political science but if you find something from anthropology that helps you answer this puzzle it's great if you can find something from popular culture, from a TV show, or something that's written on a cereal box, it's legitimate knowledge if it helps you answering this puzzle. Um, that's part of reviewing what's out there, part of engaging the knowledge is out there, but the literature. And in doing so, of course, you have to always be aware of the politics of doing so. Um, um, Huge debates uh, at the moment, of course, on questions of decolonizing knowledge, that when we do research, we often just draw on Western forms of knowledge, on, on the canon of Western scholarship, and by doing so, basically, not only um, uh, entrench Western ways of knowing, and in many ways, colonial ways of knowing, but we also forego the possibility of drawing on this rich body of literature that are out there in non-Western ways of knowing. Um, think of... So in that sense, the, the culture and race dimension of what you read, think of the gender dimensions of what you read. Um, a, a lot of you know, texts and, and, and essays are basically just populated by, by male authors. So, so be careful about who, who you engage and why and what, what the politics is of doing so. And you know, again, we could spend an entire hour on method. Uh, uh, so I'm not gonna say much about that, but your method basically is is your way of answering your research puzzle. And that's what Ian Shapiro, I mentioned him before, for he's very big on basically not starting a research um, topic with your method. You know, we all train in certain methods in my field, whether it's quantitative and qualitative methods, we might do regression analysis, we might do, we might do uh, um, interviews, we might do ethnographies, we might do a discourse analysis, but you don't start with a discourse analysis. You don't start with statistics. You start with a puzzle. Once you have a puzzle, you narrow it down to a specific research question, and after that you ask yourself, what is the most appropriate method I employ, I can employ to answer this research question? So the, 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 part, the, the method really is all about answering your research question. Uh, so you don't tailor your question to your method, but you tailor your, your method to your question. Um, and again, we can talk a lot about it, um, uh, about alternative methods. I do quite a bit of work on methods. Um, including on autoethnography as a form of research, but we'll sort of leave that aside uh, for now. The next key thing, of course, and that's pretty self-evident, but I think I want to walk through it uh, nevertheless, is that a good text uh, in my field, in international politics, I think in the most of social science, needs to have an argument. Uh, it's not enough to basically repeat uh, what is out there, to kind of summarize an issue, to present facts, to present literature. 
In order for a text to succeed, you need to have a crystal clear argument. An argument can be agreeing or disagreeing with certain positions. It can be, you know, whether it's, you know, that, that emotions are neglected or emotions play a key role or emotions you know, play in existing models. It can be about finding common problems among uh, various existing bodies of literature, you know, the, the lack of, of gender in certain forms of analysis in foreign policy, the the colonial residues in much of thinking about ethics, uh, whatever it is. It can be, yeah, pointing and neglects. It can be, ideally, a good argument in some sense, it's counterintuitive, something that takes us by surprise, and we say, ah, yeah, look, I haven't thought about that. So arguments can be a range of different things. Um, and then, of course, you have to sort of tell the reader what, what your argument, what your position adds to the existing knowledge. And it's not, in that sense, the heroic filling the gap, but it's more about uh, what can we take away from that text? You know, what, what has it helped? How has it helped us think about the world differently? You know, how has it opened our eyes, so to speak? Uh, and of course, and that's ev obvious. The argument needs to be sustained with evidence, and the evidence can be uh, empirical, it can be conceptual, but you can't just make things up. Uh, and it's not just an opinion. It's not the Oprah Winfrey show where you just say, "I think this, I think that." You know, an argument is about. Uh, a key point that's sustained with evidence systematically. Yeah. So that's a key thing that uh, that an, a text has to have, a very crystal clear argument. In many ways, I think this is the key to any kind of text, is to make, and that goes beyond the academic sort of realm of making an argument. I think any kind of key text that works well makes one clear central point, whether it is uh, an undergraduate essay, whether it's a master's thesis, a PhD thesis, whether it's um, a blog, whether it's um, a memo to a, a government official. If a text makes a crystal clear point and sus sub subordinates everything to this clear point, you have a chance of getting a point across. You know? So in some sense, when you write your texts, essays, thesis, whatever, subordinate, subordinate everything to making this clear central point. Uh, uh, Make one point and one point only. Again, I sort of illustrate that through my, my, my teaching. If, if I uh, think of my undergraduate and postgraduate essays, uh, if you write an essay, uh, I'm doing the marking, you know, I mark 30, 40 essays. If each essay makes six points, that's like hundreds of different points. You know, I, there's no way I can remember six points about every essay if I mark 50 essays. I'm just going to have a headache. The essays I remember are the ones that make one clear point, and a clear point I will remember a week later, saying, ah, oh, yes, that was the essay about X, about how foreign policy neglects gender and why this is important for this and that reason. Or the essay about, you know, the contradiction between rational actor models and the role of emotions. Whatever the point is, that's the thing you want to you wanna get across, a crystal clear point and an essay, a text that systematically presents that clear point, so that at the end the reader finishes and, and knows exactly that was the essay about X. That's the key point that came across. Um, and something that you remember basically days and weeks and ideally years later. You know, so that means stay on topic. Don't get sidetracked. And I'll, I'll, in, in the last part soon, we'll develop strategies uh, for doing so. Don't make too many points. I'll give you a, sort of a few examples of books that... I think have done that very well to basically get across one clear, one simple clear point in in a whole book. And not all books are, in my view, good books. And certainly not books I agree. The first one I mentioned here, Sam Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, is a book I fundamentally disagree with in its premise. Um, I happened to actually um, be in in the same building as as Huntington was writing this book. Um, I had a pre-doctoral fellowship at Harvard University a long time ago, at the same time when Huntington wrote his, his now famous book on the clash of civilization, which is sort of a realist take that argues in the future conflict will not be, as realists tend to say, driven by conflict between states, but by conflict between civilizations, between Western Judaic traditions and Islamic traditions, for instance. It's a very essentialist argument. It's, it, it's very problematic, but it's a crystal clear argument, you know, an entire book, and you can summarize the argument in one key point, that in the future, conflict will occur around the clash of civilization. That's one 
clear central point sustained throughout the book, and the entire book is about sustaining this clear point. Uh, Alexander Wentz wrote a very, very famous essay uh, a couple decades ago on anarchy is what states make of it, basically critiquing the neorealist assumption that states engage in conflict because they live in a world of anarchy, and in a world of anarchy out there, uh, states have to maximize their security, and their, their way of maximizing security is, by definition, a source of insecurity for the neighboring states. So this security dilemma leads to conflict in international politics. But when sort of says, well, this doesn't sort of make sense, you know, if, 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 if anarchy doesn't always break conflict, you know, the US and Canada or New Zealand and Australia, they live in a world of anarchy, but they maximize security because they have defense mechanisms, but they don't see each other uh, as necessarily a threat. So it's not just anarchy, it's anarchy and something. And again, the whole point of his argument is anarchy is what states make of it. Crystal clear, central argument captured in a clear proposition, in a, in a clear title of a book or an essay. And again, the importance of title. Titles should be there to capture your argument. Dale Spender, uh, a feminist scholar, uh, wrote a very, very insightful book called Men Made Language, in which he argues that basically language is inherently gendered, and it's a form of of, uh, of domination in that sense. Uh, and there's lots of interesting research afterwards having developed in that, including one of my uh, favorite essays by Carol Cohn called Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals. But Spender's book basically captures in the title this clear, central, compelling point that language is not neutral, language is gendered. And, and in this gendered language, basically, uh, we have an entrenchment of systems of exclusion based on gender. Crystal clear argument captures in the title men made language. Edward Said's book on cultural imperialism and his notion of Orientalism basically uh, makes the argument, the convincing argument, I think, that imperialism, colonialism, was not just about the conquest of space, but it was also the conquest of the mind. It was about the diffusion of imperial colonial values through cultures, through literature, through medical practices, through a whole range of different things. Again, that imperialism and culture are inherently linked, part of Said's central argument. Um, Judy Spotler, uh, in her argument that when life is grievable. Uh, here she argues that basically not all victims around the world are given the same kind of moral ethical attention. Uh, if there's a disaster somewhere in New York or, or in, in Paris, a terrorist attack, it basically makes headline around the world. Everyone pays attention to it. We all feel sorry for the victims. If there's a disaster somewhere in the developing world, in Mali somewhere, Hardly anyone pays attention around the world. The big newspapers don't report it. So, so Butler's argument is that not every life is equally grievable. We grieve more for some lives than for others. Um, we grieve more for when someone in our family dies than someone far off in a place we don't know dies. So this is about the politics of, of, of making certain things grievable, certain lives grievable, and others not. Again, crystal clear argument developed captured in one sentence and then developed over an entire book systematically. Uh, the last example is from an author I very much enjoy, uh, David Morris, around uh, the culture of pain. In fact, I had an opening of one of his books as well as an example of wonderful writing. And here, his argument is basically that pain, physical pain, is not just something that basically happens in our bodies. When we hurt ourselves, pain is not just objectively a physical phenomena, but it's a cultural phenomena. It's about how the cultures that surround us convey to us how we should feel about pain, what pain is, how we communicate pain. So pain in that sense is always more than physical. It's also cultural. That's why you know, his argument is about the cultural pain, the links between culture and pain. So here are just sort of illustrations about, about the need, the importance of making one clear central argument in your text. I think this is one of the most important things to get across in a text blog, essay, thesis, whatever it is, book, and so on. Next thing is, how do you then structure um, your text? So how do you go about structuring it? And I give you the what I think is sort of a very standard structure that you can't go wrong with, but like with any sort of good text, uh, any good text is you, you learn the rules and then you do a really good text by breaking the rules. 
but you can't go wrong with the following structure. You have an introduction basically that pulls the reader in. So you have a super sexy title, a title that captures, you know, the reader's attention, you know, the clash of civilization, man-made language, whatever it is. The first paragraph of, of your text should be your puzzle. Basically, the first paragraph should pull the reason, reader in and give the reader a reason to read on. You know, again, all religions preach love. Why is there so much conflict around religion? So the reader wants to read on and want to say, yeah, I want to find out. I want to read this essay. I want to read this book. I want to read this thesis and find out the answer to this puzzle. Next paragraph can be a crystal clear um, um, statement of what the objective of your text is you know to say like in in this essay in this whatever this thesis i'm going to do x my objective is this and here you sort of start to narrow things down you say you know i'm not going to deal with all of the religions all i'm going to do is i'm going to look at whatever i'm going to look at the issue of a terrorist attack that happened in belgium a couple of years ago and see what role religious tensions played in in this terrorist attack whatever we just made that up the next argument could be, or the next, the next paragraph then could be, a crystal clear statement of your argument. You say, look, in my text, or I, I will argue in this text that X, Y. This is sort of where basically, um, basically, uh, you, you state exactly what's going to be your key point in the essay. Remember, there's one clear central point. State it up front, and then afterwards develop it clearly. You might want to have another paragraph or two to elaborate a little bit, but you don't need much. It's also helpful, I think, for the reader to actually announce the structure of your text, give a bit of a sense of what you're going to do. You know, I'm first going to review the existing literature on religion. Then I'm going to outline, you know, the kind of case study I'm going to do. Then I will develop these two forms of analysis, and then I will conclude from this, this and that. So basically, just in one paragraph, a sense of what the reader expects, so the reader can sort of think ahead and knows what, what's coming. I think it's also very useful to have at the end of your introduction a sort of disclaimer, to say that, look, you know, I'm fully aware this is a huge topic, you know, there's all these different literatures out there on it, and there's no way I can engage in this, but I'm fully aware of it. And this way, a reader, if you kind of do a, an essay for a class, uh, an examiner, cannot critique you for not having looked broadly enough. You know, you show the reader basically, and know this literature is complex, make some references to some of the key books out there, and, t and tell the reader, I'm not going to engage all of this, all I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm going to engage my key topic, and I will do so systematically for this and that reason. This is why I focus on that. Um, so do so, and again, maybe to come back to sort of style as well, um, if you do so, uh, in my view, and there's a lot of the literature on that, it's perfectly fine to use first-person language to say, you know, I will argue in this essay, uh, my key argument is there's this sort of old-fashioned sort of belief in my field, political science, that we have to write in the third person, that we cannot use a first person, that we have to write. This essay argues, it is argued that I think this is clunky, it's unnecessary, it pretends that you as the author has nothing to do with the text, which is silly. So I think write in first person if that makes you feel comfortable. Take charge of the text. Show the reader that there's a reader there, that there's a, there's a writer there, someone with a personality, someone with a passion, so to speak. Um, the main body of the text then basically, in my view, is structured in a way that best sustains your argument. Think of basically of telling a story. Think of, 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 of a narrative of how you want to sort of develop your key point. Um, Split the main body up into sections, three or four sections, whichever are, are appropriate. Use section headings and make sure each section, again, makes one clear central point. A central point that reinforces your overall argument. And make sure the heading title, the, the title of the heading captures this central point. So again, that the reader can very clearly read, uh, uh, get a sense of what your key point is. Um, then conclusion basically just repeat, remind remind the reader what what the key point of what the key objective of the essay has been, what the key point has been, and why it's significant. Uh, have the reader walk away and again try to remember this is the essay that's funky, interesting for this and that reason, and it makes this clear central point. Uh, that's a standard structure, but you can structure any essay in a whole range of different ways. You can do it differently. But ultimately, I think the bottom line is, no matter how you structure your essay, 
you got to make sure you get one key point across um, so that the reader can remember what your text was all about. I try to do that, uh, help doing that, uh, as an example here, how I work with my PhD students, um, with all of my PhD students, in fact, with myself too, when I work on a text, whether it's an essay or a book or here like a, a PhD thesis, I have my PhD students write a, a one-page plan. Basically put the entire PhD thesis, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000 words on one page. So clear, what's the key objective? What's the key argument of the thesis? Four, five, six chapter. With each chapter, what is the key objective of the chapter? What is the key argument of the chapter? So that basically when you write a long text, you work on it over three or four or five years, you don't lose track. You remember, all right, the key objective of my thesis is X, and this is the argument I want to develop. The argument often comes in later. This is an example here from one of my former PhD students, Nilanjana Premaratna, who uh, not only finished a, a fantastic thesis, but then also managed to publish it as a book uh, on the role of theater uh, in peace-building processes. At that stage, this is an example of a one-page plan doing the thesis, and Nilanjana has given me permission to, to reproduce that here. She hadn't at this stage developed an argument because she was still in the, in the stage of trying to figure out what my key argument is. Again, puzzle-driven research. By the end of the thesis, it wouldn't have said hypothesis here, it would have said argument, because by then she would have settled on what the key argument is. And then basically each chapter makes one clear point, and one point only. And then afterwards it's about basically having 80,000 words to, 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 to structure it in a way that makes one clear central point. And here it's the importance of dialogue, uh, the importance of how theater promotes dialogue and multi kind of voiced um, engagements and, and, and how this is useful for basically getting over conflict and, and providing peace. Um, uh, so that's what I do with all of my PhD students, with all of my own work, is I try to put the key essence of a text on one page. Um, my students like me for it, and I think they hate me for it. You know, the first plan usually is about five pages long. They want to cramp everything in and say, no, too much. Just get it down to the very, very, very essence, to boil it down to the essence. What is the key point of, 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 of chapter one? What is the key argument of chapter one? That's all you need to do. Chapter one needs to only get across one clear central point. That's all you need to do. Then you move on to chapter two. Um, so I'm almost done now. Um, um, the last sort of couple of things I want to stress is the same principles really apply to paragraph structure. When you get into the more micro elements of a text is each paragraph really should make one point. Think of when you write a paragraph, what's the point of this paragraph? And perhaps most importantly, make sure the key point of this paragraph is captured in the first line of a paragraph. You know. I think a good text should be written such that I can read the text, say an essay, in about 30 seconds by only reading the first line of each paragraph. So a good exercise, when you have a draft, for instance, block out the entire paragraphs except for the first line, and then read through your text and see, is my text crystal clear? The puzzle, the, the, the objective, the argument, the key part of section one, key part of section two, is everything clearly captured in the first line of a paragraph? Never, ever put something trivial in the first line of a paragraph. You know, the first line of a paragraph has to capture the reader, like the first line of, of a text. You know, he couldn't even spell Albuquerque. That should be the first line of a paragraph. Never, ever bury something important in the middle of a paragraph. For instance, never say in the middle of a paragraph, I argue that this is. You know, when you say argue, argue is, is, is like a red flag. The reader will pay attention. The reader will very, very will pay very close attention. So when you say I argue, this essay argues, put that in the first line of a paragraph so that it sticks out. The reader can see it right away. Um, then afterwards, you now develop your paragraph like you would do an essay after the opening opening line in which you capture the reader's attention with the key point. Develop the point and then afterwards uh, uh, have a, a wrap up session and move on to the next paragraph. Important as well is don't have all paragraphs of the same length. You know, you're going to basically put a reader to sleep if you have paragraph, 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 especially if they're long paragraphs. So alterate the lengths of paragraphs. For instance, have two or three longish paragraphs 
and then have one short paragraph in which you say something very, very important. A short paragraph in between long ones sticks out. Remember when I gave you the example of um, John Caputo, where you had one paragraph just saying, I am against ethics. That sticks out. You know, the reader will see that visually on the page, I am against ethics. An entire paragraph just is one sentence. Uh, so, so highlight your key points in these short paragraphs that stick out. Use the aesthetics, the visual of the text, in order to draw the reader's attention to key points. Um, Finally, the last point, uh, to do all that, to get all that right, again, think of Matisse, think of you can't just write an essay, have it done, and it's, it's there. So you need to have lots of time to basically mold the text, rewrite it, adjust it, fine-tune it. Uh, so write a text early, finish it early, gain some distance, give it to a friend to read, against, again, ideally someone who knows nothing about your field, uh, an intelligent reader who can tell you, this text makes sense, or this text is accessible, or, or tells you, look, this is too, it's too complicated, it's, it, 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 I can't really understand what you're saying, then you know you have to go back to the drawing board. So, so finish early, redraft it, and go to different versions of redrafting, paying different attention to different things. You know, pay attention to, for instance, the argument. Have I articulated my argument clearly? Does every single section contribute to the argument, do I come back to it again clearly, do all the titles of the sections clearly flag the key points, you know, is the structure well, does it flow? Um, one set of readings only pay attention to paragraphs. Do I have a nice mixture of long, short, medium paragraphs? Does every single opening line of the paragraph say something important? Do I have something buried in the middle of a paragraph that's important? If not, have a paragraph break to make it stick out. Then do an entire set of reading, just paying attention to rhythm and flow. And, you know, if in doubt, you know, uh, use short sentences, use active voice rather than passive voice. But, you know, one set of reading, just stand up, walk around with the text, read it aloud to you, and you will notice when you get stuck dancing, when the, when the text doesn't flow. So go back, redraft the sentences so that the sentences flow. Uh, so all this, uh, will take time. Pay attention to aesthetics, to how, how the text looks like. So again, uh, long paragraphs in between short ones. Pay attention to font. You know, for instance, uh, uh, a lot of people hate reading Times Roman. You know, I'm not sure what it is, but a lot of people hate Times Roman. So I, I tend to use Calibri, for instance. But use a font that you feel is attractive aesthetically. Aesthetics is extremely important to, to a text. Make sure your footnotes are all correct, systematic. You know, if, if your, your footnoting style is messed up, if you have sometimes, you know, brackets or not brackets and it's inconsistent, it can really kind of detract from the substance of your text. So the aesthetic is, is hugely important. Um, pay attention to titles, to spacing, to a whole range of different things. Um, find a sexy title. Again, that's one of the key things, you know, like man-made language, uh, cultural imperialism, uh, the clash of civilization, uh, 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 it, uh, um, um, a range of sort of you know key key texts. Uh, finally, you know, look uh, again. I have uh, I've rambled on a bit too long here. I understand, uh, and what I've tried to give you basically is is the lessons I have learned from my own struggle with writing over the last thirty years, from having worked with students, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, PhD students, colleagues. These are my personal kind of uh, experiences. Uh, not everyone would agree with them. People would would have different views on what good writing is, especially in my field. Uh, um, people probably are much better writers than I am. They would have insights that I haven't have missed so far. So this is not to give you the key insight into writing, the best way of writing. It's simply my 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 way of going about it. And it's in some ways it's 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 standard sort of um, uh, suggestions. And the key thing, of course, is once you know the standards kind of approach to things about structure, about argument, then you can also break them and you can find different ways um, of writing. Um, so this is, uh, hopefully it has been useful. And again, uh, I've sort of done that primarily for my students here at the University of Queensland. Uh, where I usually do a session on writing, but I hope uh, that some of you might also find it useful uh, uh, in general. And that's why I thought I might actually put it up on, on the web in case anyone finds uh, certain benefits in that. So, so good luck with writing. 
that I find it's writing is an absolutely wonderful, creative, stimulating activity. And I hope you, you enjoy it as well. And I hope my remarks have, have helped you doing that. So good luck and thanks a lot.